In this video, I will show you my city, Beirut. A city of conflict and coexistence, of chaos and charm, of cultural revival and decadence. This plot of land in the mountains just 20 minutes from Beirut was once my grandparents' house and the place where my family spent the summer months. It's the place where I have the most vivid memories of my childhood. This plot looks so tiny now, but when I was a child, it felt huge. It felt like a mansion. Souk al Gharab, this villa, used to be a summer resort. During the war, however, it became the epicenter of so many battles. So in the 1980s, almost the whole village was destroyed. It was my first-hand experience of the politics of that time, which in part drew me to journalism. Beirut was divided back then between a mostly Muslim West and a mostly Christian East. Now, on the surface at least, the city is reunited. It's one of the last bastions of coexistence in a region beset by war. A vibrant corner where people drawn from different religions live side by side, and where neighborhoods can hear church bells ring as prayers blare from mosques. There's more freedom here than anywhere else in the Middle East. The state in Lebanon has always been weak, and that has its pluses and its minuses. On the plus side, it makes for a very vibrant media scene. It also makes for competitive, although very sectarian, politics. People say there can never be a dictatorship in Lebanon because there are so many mini-dictators and they're always squabbling. Socially, too, Lebanon is more westernized and more progressive than elsewhere in the region. Although the laws haven't always kept up, society moves at its own tune, regardless. In many ways, the war feels like a distant memory. I sometimes think of it as a forced amnesia. But there are people who want it to be remembered if only for those who survived, not to forget the lessons. Beit Beirut or Beirut House is a museum of the war. It's a building that used to lie on the line dividing the city's warring factions, known then as the Green Line. The Green Line, what you used to call the Green Line, used to go through here. Snipers took hold of this building and transformed it into a war machine. And they remained here for over 17 years. Youssef Haidar is the architect of Be Beirut's preservation and someone I had interviewed before about the selective memory of the Lebanese. He'd reminded me of a Beirut I had also forgotten. This is the first museum dedicated to the war, and not only the war, this I insist on that aspect, we're talking about memory. And in memory, we shouldn't be selective. The major approach in our country, like you know, we went from a huge war, we went through a process of general amnesty that led to a general amnesia, and the process is still going on. The civil society did some actions in order to do the right duty towards our memory. But on the state level, on the public level, nothing has been done. These are the souks in downtown Beirut. Before the war, they were the commercial heart of the city. My parents and their parents before them used to shop here. After the war, when this area was rebuilt, they kept the same layout, the same names of the souks, but it was rebuilt with a different character, a different feel. It's a lot fancier. What some sociologists would say is that what the souks now reflect is a post-war society's obsession with consumerism, commercialization, a kind of escapism. The souks were rebuilt in the image of billionaire Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri, the architect of Lebanon's reconstruction. His assassination in 2005 was one of many targeted killings that have haunted post-war Lebanon. After Hadiri's death, the Lebanese found unusual unity, leading to the Cedar Revolution. Mass protests forced Syria, which controlled Lebanon at the time, to pull its troops out. 
but the unity didn't last. Since then, Lebanon has moved from one sectarian standoff to another. During the civil war, it was mainly Christians and Muslims who fought each other. In more recent years, it's been largely between Sunni and Shia Muslims, a reflection of the broader power struggle in the Middle East. Just recently, Beirut was gripped by a mystery over the fate of its prime minister, Saad Hadiri. He resigned suddenly while on a trip to Saudi Arabia. Although he has since retracted his resignation, many in Lebanon were reminded of their country's vulnerability and now expect it to become another theater of confrontation between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Despite the tensions, most young people here still get a good education. At the American University of Beirut, which I attended briefly, they offer one of the best programs in the Arab world. But many graduates end up going abroad because they can't find jobs in Lebanon. Tarek Mitri, a professor at the university, is a former government minister and now an independent politician and lecturer. Very few of my friends I have that live in Beirut have their children here. And if we find one who has a daughter married to a Lebanese that lives uh, still in Beirut, say, how lucky you are. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an exception sometimes. Yeah, yeah of course. It's, it's very, it impoverishes life, a, a city without uh, its younger people. Those who do stay, old and young, have managed to preserve Lebanon's traditional role as a cultural center in the Arab world. Lebanon is a very centralized country, not just in terms of the political system, but everything else. The economy is in Beirut, cultural life is in Beirut. So, uh, so most Lebanese uh, have an intimate relationship with the city. There is a myth about the city's uh, history. I mean, the good old days of Beirut are remembered even by people who have not seen those days. There's a good myth that has been transmitted to the younger generation about the city. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's cosmopolitan, religiously pluralist. Uh, it's a city where people enjoy, uh, absolute is not the word, but great freedom, freedom of uh, creativity, thought, uh, free press. There is a measure of vibrancy in the country. I've heard many Europeans, but also Lebanese, tell me that they like uh, this place because of the, this is now a very common word that young people use because of the energy there is in it. There are examples of creative expression all over the city, even in its most impoverished parts. Civil society is using art to counter the years of war and neglect. But no amount of creativity can conceal Beirut's glaring contradictions. It is true that many residents of the city can be found lounging by the sea as soon as the sun comes up or eating out in its many restaurants or enjoying the legendary nightlife. But the buzz conceals a grim economic reality. There's very little growth, there's high unemployment, and 25 years after the end of the civil war, still nothing much works in the city. There's no public transport, there's no parking, there's no mobility, there's no planning. And we have zero planning because we have corruption. Mona Hallaq is a member of the Beirut Madinati Group, or Beirut is my city, a collection of socially minded Beirutis whose aim is to bring change to the city. The movement was born two years ago after a garbage crisis that left rivers of rubbish filling the streets. People couldn't walk without having garbage in their nose. So people suddenly understood that the politicians do not care about them. They were still fighting about the next garbage contract, who will take what part, of what, what part will go to whom. It's corruption over corruption over corruption. We are divided to the bones. We are divided not only sectarian, we are divided intersectarian. And nothing will unite us except a non-sectarian movement that will actually tell the people, stand up to your rights of breathing fresh air, of driving without being stressed, of having no garbage in, your, in, in front of your door. I want my city for my son to be a better place. And although it's very difficult, 
and for, for the, that we have been fighting for a long time and the progress is really slow, but we think that we, change can be, can be possible. Beirut and Lebanon are never safe from domestic tensions, nor are they far from regional crises. Squeezed between Israel and Syria, the country is like a football that gets bounced around, often with high cost. The strongest faction in Lebanon is Hezbollah, an armed Shia group backed by Iran. Hezbollah's main war has been with Israel, but it has also intervened in Syria's civil war on the side of the regime, losing thousands of fighters. The war in Syria has been a huge burden on Lebanon, with some 1.5 million refugees crossing the border since 2011. The influx has split the country further. Everyone in Lebanon knows that as long as Syria is troubled or ruled by a leader with designs on Lebanon, and as long as there is no settlement between Arabs and Israelis, Lebanon won't be at peace. It's easy to see why many Lebanese live abroad. There are, in fact, more of them living outside Lebanon than within. And yet I and many others who've made their lives elsewhere remain attached to the country. It's as if we can't live with it, but nor can we completely live without it. So about eight years ago, and after a long search, we found this apartment. It's in an old Beiruti house. It's a nice reminder for our children of their roots. We come here for Christmas, we come in the summer, we come whenever we can to visit family and friends. The apartment is close to the Corniche by the sea, where we like to walk or jog in the mornings. There are times when there's so much tension in Lebanon that it's not even wise to travel here. And there's definitely, in this tiny corner of the Middle East, a lot that can repel you. And yet, despite all the problems, despite all the chaos, Beirut has warmth, it has energy, it has charm. It always pulls you back.